at 10 o'clock block on a given Tuesday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Uh, more specifically, we're talking to Common Cause today. I'm so excited. Not only Common Cause here with Sandy Ma, who we've talked to many times, but Sylvia Albert, who who joins us from where? Where are you, Sylvia? You're in Georgia? Washington, D.C. Okay, well, it's only a stone's throw, although it could be a, a zillion miles away, too, depending. <laughs> So let's talk about voting rights. The, my proposition to you in the name of this discussion, the name of the, the episode is, um, mm, mm, uh, is it lost? Is the bill lost? Sylvia, you've been, you've been following this day and night. So see what you can do with that question. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, this is an important topic, and I'm glad that you and others are talking about it. Um, is the bill lost? You know, the question of this particular bill, I think, is less important than is voting rights on a whole lost? Have we really devolved into not having a democracy anymore? And is there a chance to still save things? And I think the answer to that is yes. I absolutely understand the frustration with Senators Manchin and Cinema, with the uh, failure of the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act from passing. But I do honestly try very hard to remember that, you know, it took a long time for the Civil Rights Act to pass. It took a long time for the Voting Rights Act to pass, right? You know, um, John Lewis didn't get across the Edmund Pettus Bridge the first time. It was multiple times before he got across the bridge. So I don't think that voting rights on as a whole is completely gone. I think um, the window for this particular bill uh, seems to have closed with Senators Manchin and Cinema, but that doesn't mean that we stop. That means we change tactics and move to the states and other ways to protect the vote. Hmm. I want to ask you about that. Um, you know, it's like Sisyphus, you know, the myth of Sisyphus, mm -hmm. um, where you keep, you know, trying to get up that hill and you get a part way and then whoop, you slip down again and then you just start again. You know, didn't we have a voting rights bill in this country? Um, what, what happened? Um, we did, and we do. What happened is that people in power want to stay in power. And the way to do that is to ensure that new, no, no new people can vote, right? If I want to stay in power uh, to do that, I only want the people who vote for me to be able to vote. And so just um, that's what's been happening, you know, things have chipped away at the Voting Rights Act. And the reality is that the Voting Rights Act was passed more than 50 years ago. And there are new tactics. Social media didn't exist, <laughs> you know. Uh, the internet didn't exist. There are things that have changed. And so the rules need to also be updated to deal with the current realities and the current threats that we have. No, it's hard to understand. I mean, I, I will, Sort of collapse what M Mansion and, and Cinema did. Uh, it's not about the filibuster. It's about voting rights. That's what it was about, and and their votes were votes against voting rights. What I don't understand is why anyone. Well, maybe you already answered this. Why anybody who supposedly represents the the, the the people or cares about the future of the country would vote against voting rights. Um, I think you've you've kind of given an answer, but I wonder if you want to embellish what 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 went through their minds. Do you think they were thinking about the filibuster at all? You think the GOP, uh, you know, who would vote against it, you know, lockstep, knee jerk, are thinking about the filibuster? Um, maybe it's 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 they want to stay in power, and they don't care about the country, and they don't care about sort of updating our government to meet. The social changes that have that have taken place that are taking place. I mean, we're at a real crisis point, don't you think? Oh, I agree. I agree that it's completely about staying in power. And uh, regardless of party, politicians want to stay in power. I know that people uh, have tried to make this bill a Democrat versus Republican thing. It's really not. It's about having access. It just it just so happens that the uh, that Democrats in power think that. Uh, this bill will help them keep power, right? So uh, it really is neither here nor there whether or not it's supported by Democrats or Republicans. In this case, um, yes, the Republican Party does not want to lose power um, by letting people actually have access to the ballot. 
so they're against it. You know, Senators Manchin and Cinema have calculated for themselves that they can remain in power or maintain um, whatever they power they want, whether it's in the private sector or not. Um, and by continuing to stay with the Republican Party in this sense. So um, I, I agree. I think that they are they have made the calculation that they can maintain power by doing these, by taking these actions. And that's what they're doing. I want to get to the question of what, if anything, could be done. And one thing you said a minute ago struck me. It said, well, you know, it, it, it took several tries to cross the bridge and several tries to get certain rights, certain civil rights in place in this country. Um, but the question I put to you, you know, look at all the things that are happening, all the risks, all the, mm, the things that Trump revealed about the country uh, or exacerbated. Um, do we have time? Do we have time to wait to cross the bridge later again? Or are we at such risk that we don't have the time and we are in um, you know, a situation where if we can't reverse this and soon we will lose, I say we, I mean, Democrats will, will lose uh, the Congress completely uh, in 2022, lose the presidency in 2024, and they will have their way with us on public policy. Um, well, first, you know, as, as I'm sure as you know, Common Cause does not support a particular party, um, and so I can't really speak to. I'm. I, 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 the guard. Of the, of I, the I can be independent too, and I. Right. It's, it's, it, call call me a, a person who believes in democracy. I don't know if that's politicized or a political party or not. Unfortunately, these days it does feel like it is right. It does feel like the political party um, believes in democracy, and one does not. Uh, but as I've said, you know, I think that that relates to what uh, parties uh, think they can do to maintain power. Um, if we want to take the bridge analogy further, um, I would say, you know, maybe we're not crossing the bridge, but we're finding ways to get around the bridge. We're going upriver. <laughs> so, you know, up river. it's out of the box upriver. <laughs> exactly. So we, you know, this might not have been successful, but um, I'm sure you've been hearing already about various um, um, senators working on a bipartisan fix to the Electoral Count Act, which would protect against some of the shenanigans that um, the, uh, the Stop the Steal groups um, have been working on. And we also have, you know, as always litigation, yes, the Voting Rights Act is not in its former position and it's not as strong as it can be, but we will take those the, those chances as well. We'll work in state to pass good policies and where there are bad policies, work with good election officials who actually want to help people have access to the ballot. So there is not one avenue. This would have been a great avenue and I still think it's possible in the future. Um, and it would have really helped ensure that everybody had the same access to the ballot across the country regardless of their demographics and their zip code or their race. But um, that doesn't mean that we can't still be fighting the fight on the ground. And we have to, right? If, if the first time the Voting Rights Act failed to pass, everybody gave up and said, well, I guess we didn't make it, um, we wouldn't be here, right? You continue to gain momentum by working at the local level. And I completely understand that um, sometimes that's hard to remember. And sometimes it's hard to see the future of doing that, but the power is with the people. And when we activate it, we can make real change. Okay, well, I'd like to break that down a little bit, unpack that, as they say. Um, on, on the question of whether you can break the, you know, it's like uh, Biden wants to break the Build Back Better bill into several parts. And okay, there's, there's a possibility there of reaching bipartisan back scratch kinds of projects. Mm -hmm. Um, but but in voting, you know, the reason, as I get it, the reason that the, the Republicans don't want any uh, uh, voting rights or reform or to, uh, you know, un, unroll uh, what they have done over the past few years uh, is because they want to shut people out of voting. So if you if you say, well, why don't we divide that bill up into component parts? Let's pass a little this and a little that. They're going to have the same objection to every component part, and they're not going to do it. 
Um, for example, you know, gerrymandering, they're, they're not going to do it. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, even, even the, um, you know, the Counting Act uh, or the electoral college reforms and all that, if the status quo satisfies their need to stay in power, they're not going to do it. So I, I think my own thing, and I'm interested in your re response, um, my own thinking is that that's, that's dead end because you know already that they have the votes, they have mansion, cinema, no, you know, no reform to sil filibuster, and, and anything that smells like voting reform, they're not going to do it. So why even try? Uh, and, and your point is well taken. You have to do something, something we have to do because we're alive. Um, and uh, we, you know, we believe in this country. Um, and so I would focus my attention on the courts. But what about the first part of that? Do you agree with me that breaking it down isn't going to work? Well, I think um, there are two things there. First, the Electoral Count Act. I would point, there actually is a bipartisan group of senators um, who are working on that. And that would include the senators who did not support the um, attempt to overthrow the government. So you, we can get to 60 votes, actually, um, by with those senators in place and there. Um, and so I think that's an important possibility. Obviously, we don't think it's enough. We think the Voting Rights Act um, and the Freedom to Vote Act are just as important, uh, more important. Um, and as to the other, other, I would point out actually that a lot of these reforms that we are champion in the free, championing in the Freedom to Vote Act are in um, Republican jurisdictions, our states, right? Um, Alaska has automatic voter registration through their oil dividends, right? There are, um, you know, lots of states that have absentee voting, that have drop boxes, you know, places that are hard are, Utah is 100% vote by mail, right? So even states that are um, strongly Republican have used these policies and used them well. What we're seeing now is right an attempt to ensure that in swing states and states that Republicans don't have power over, that they don't um, allow more people to vote and lose power there. But I think, but I think it actually is really important to note that Republicans across the country use these policies um, and have used them for years, and in that way, I think that they can be successful um, at the local level. And well, you know, Tip O'Neill used to say all politics is local. So, but that makes a, a different kind of effort by Common Cause and other organizations that would like to fix this because it means you've got to go jurisdiction by jurisdiction, uh, legislature by legislature, governor by governor, and you won't be successful in all of them. But you could shore it up that way. I, I would have to agree with that. And that's, that's certainly a worthy thing. It also stands as a beacon to the other states. Um, and to the GOP, for that matter. But, but let's move on to, uh, well, let's, let's have a moment with Sandy, okay? <laughs> I'm happy to let Sylvia um, voice, you know, buoy you us and, and fill us up with hope. <laughs> well, how are we doing in, in terms of the, um, you know, voting restrictions, suppression, or, or we, have, we have a pretty good mail-in mail ballot arrangement here in Hawaii. Um, people say that Hawaii is, um, you know, it's a liberal state as far as voting is concerned. Is that true? Um, Hawaii has done very well with our voting policies. We have online voter registration, so people could register to vote online, update their voter registration, and check that their voter registration information is current. Uh, we have um, same-day voter registration, so come election day, if you uh, want to uh, register to vote, you can uh, go to an in-person voter service center and register to vote and vote. We have uh, vote by mail. It was passed in 2019 and uh, first started in 2020 where um, ballots are mailed to all registered voters. Um, and we just passed in 2021 automatic voter registration. So when you go to the DMV or go um, get a state ID, um, your information, um, and you opt in to register to vote uh, when you get a, a driver's license or a state ID, the information is automatically trans transferred to the county elections division. And so then the ballot will get mailed to you because we're all vote by mail state. So we do have a lot of ways uh, for people to register to vote 
um, in Hawaii. So we are, are one of the uh, really um, great states uh, to become a registered voter and get a ballot. We should be proud. Sylvia, you should be proud. You know, Common Cause Absolutely. has been watching this issue in Hawaii, and we have, we've, the, the bottom line is we have a good system here. You should be proud. I'm very proud of Sandy's work. Sandy has been a one woman warrior um, the last few years in Hawaii. And, um, you know, as she pointed out there, Hawaii has some great policies and um, implement and having those policies implemented well is really important. And that's what um, people like Sandy are doing as making sure and helping election officials and testifying to make sure those policies are enacted in an equitable way across Hawaii. So I'm very proud uh, to, to be working with Sandy. Mm -hmm. Implementation well, is key. Implementation <laughs> is key. I mean, we could always uh, have improvements. For example, for our vote by mail system, we could always have more drop boxes and more in-person voter service centers. Not everyone um, has a mailbox. Uh, for example, our uh, unsheltered population um, Cannot uh, have a drop uh, Cannot have a you know piece of mail mailed to them, and they certainly have a right to vote um, if they're a U.S. citizen, uh, intend to remain in Hawaii, and want to vote. So we need more in-person voter service centers. Um, so yes, uh, there, there could always be improvements to the process. And you're working on them. Uh, we always work on improvements to our uh, our uh, election system and how to modernize it. Uh, we like a uh, you know, language notification of uh, translation services uh, to, to all voters, uh, you know, people who would like uh, the ballot to be translated in the language that they are comfortable voting in. We are working on that for the 2022 session. Uh, there is uh, a few bill, there are a few bills dealing with um, uh, voter pamphlets, uh, um, Floating around in 2022, we hope uh, people take that up seriously. Um, uh, that's we are also working on ranked choice voting for uh, special federal elections and vacant county council seats to bring uh, ranked choice voting to Hawaii. So those are some bills we're also working on. Great. I, I take it that uh, voting and voting rights are a, a very important issue for Common Cause, and you are focusing on that uh, as much or more than you did in the past because it's more important now. Am I right, Sylvia? Well, I would say, you know, the Common Cause's mission has always been, um, you know, a country that is of, by, and for the people. And I think, um, you know, it started as, a, as an organization that was more focused on ethics reform but, and money in politics. But as we've grown and as the country has changed, I think it's been very important to realize that, um, you know, the Voting Rights Act was the start of a fight. It was not the beginning of the fight, right? And ensuring access to the ballot is really the only way to ensure that um, we are a country of, by, and for the people. Yeah, well, well, we're at great risk now. So I want to explore with you, Sylvia, a couple of things. One is, um, one is the, the, the courts, the courts. You mentioned the courts, and I think about the courts, too. And for the lack of um, you know action in Congress, this is very so sad, and um, you know the difficulty of dealing with uh, Republican-led states um, have to go to court. On the other hand, there are some judges who uh, were appointed to the federal bench, for example, over the past few years, that in my view should not be sitting on the federal bench and not qualified, um, but they got there anyway, uh, thanks to Mitch McConnell and some of his friends in the Senate, um, and many of his friends in the Senate. So I guess what I'm asking is, uh, how, how, how confident are you that you can get some of these obviously outrageous provisions that were adopted in Republican legislators, legislatures around the country uh, thrown out uh, in the courts? It sounds like it's a long slog, and it's a timing issue there, uh, and that you don't have any real guarantee that the courts will agree with voting rights. That is true. There is never a guarantee. Um, we obviously don't have the strength of the Voting Rights Act uh, as it was and as it should be. Um, and that is that is unfortunate, but that does not mean that we don't give up. There are 
also a good amount of um, state constitutions that in, that maintain a right to vote and allow us other avenues for litigation. Uh, and I also want to point out, even with those who are on the bench um, that were appointed by the former president, we have seen those individuals still follow the law and maintain um, maintain a, our democracy. You know, the in the over sixty lawsuits that President Trump filed and his and his friends filed in, to try to overturn the results of the twenty twenty election were all thrown out, and a good amount of them by Trump appointed judges. So we, you know. While we agree that there are judges on the bench who have taken uh, actions that we don't agree with and we think are unconstitutional, we also think that there's still a chance and we still have to keep fighting. Oh, I totally agree. Big fight. It's a sort of a national fight because there's so many jurisdictions and so many provisions and they're different. Some of them are more creative even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. creative solutions like Roe v. Wade in Texas. You know, that's really creative. You got you to give them credit for creativity, dark creativity, but creativity nevertheless. Um, so, okay, but in the end, you're going to have splits. You're going to have some judges who agree that voting rights is important for the future of the country and others who are oblivious to that or who are politicized about that. And ultimately, the likelihood is going to get to the Supreme Court in some kind of crunch case. Um, or maybe a series of crunch cases over voting rights. And one of, the, one of the issues there is when, when is it going to get to the Supreme Court? And the second one is what are they going to do? Um, can we rely on them to be non-political? Can we rely on them not to be, um, you know, not to be mm, politicized? Um, how do you feel about that? Uh, can we rely on the Supreme Court after all the, after all the litigation in the lower courts? Well, I think, as you said, we can never guarantee, the courts are not guaranteed, and that is whether local or the Supreme Court. I just do want to point out, though, that cases that are brought under the state constitutions do not go to the U.S. Supreme Court. They go to the final arbiter of the state, which is usually the state Supreme Court, um, or some states have weird names for them, like I think New York name for its Supreme Court is not Supreme Court, it's something else. No, that's but, right. the, the New York Supreme Court is the is the court of general jurisdiction. Yes, we all learned that watching Law and Order because we were very <laughs> confused. I learned um, it in law school myself, but okay. <laughs> um, so there are, you know, as I said, we never rely on one court, we never rely on one judge, we never rely on one avenue. So we continue to try advocacy, litigation, grassroots support, you know, registering voters, getting people out there, you know, we will try every tool in the toolkit. Um, and we believe that a combination of them will get us where we need to go. It may take a while, um, but, you know, we will get there. Okay, I'm, I'm with you on that. But let me ask, um, you know, you, you, have a, you have a timing problem um, because uh, some of these cases in all of those courts could be stuck um, and unresolved. Um, by November or even you know, November of 2024. Matter of fact, if you're talking about elections these days, it's earlier than November. It could be October, it could be September. Um, so query, what happens if we, we have lots of cases, but no resolution um, prior to election day? Um, and then of course, on, on and after election day, we have the efforts of the GOP to you know, muck up the results. Well, you know, um, what we have when there are bad policies, which there are in all states, um, regardless of their red or blue, what we have is advocates on the ground doing whatever they can to help ensure that people have access to the ballot and that their ballot counts. So even where people can't use absentee voting in Texas, unless they have an excuse, we are still in Texas helping people get access to the ballot in other ways. So, you know, there, there is no one size fits all um, solution, but it really involves a lot of people, a lot of grassroots support, a lot of advocates, people helping people um, have and, access to the ballot. And also the media plays a role. I mean, the, the yes. media is, is culpable in some ways for not calling out, you know, and, um, yeah, 
you know, false rhetoric or misinformation or disinformation as much as they should, but the media also acts as, um, in the proper circumstance, uh, as an independent watchdog and helping, um, you know, shine a light on bad practices. And so the media is also um, helping, um, you know, um, draw attention to the issues on the ground. And so, um, you know, like you, Jay, um, having Common Cause on to talk about these issues and, you know, highlighting the importance of voting rights, um, you know, that, that helps us with our work. It helps us, you know, recruit volunteers, um, you know, to do our work. So uh, the media is, is a very helpful partner. Um, so thank you. Well, you know, the, the, I, I totally agree, Sandy. It's an excellent point. But I tell you what I worry about, you know, you have various kinds of media and media with various agendas. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of noise in social media, a lot of confusion coming out of it. Uh, they don't necessarily want to educate people. Mm, they prefer to confuse them. And so you have the risk of the electorate, um, the, the public being confused by the time of the way. They don't know whether they can vote or not vote. Uh, they're not necessarily educated on the latest uh, changes, developments, expectations, um, and either A, they don't vote. The, the, a pox on all of this. I'm really tired. I have I have media fatigue. I'm not going to do. I'm not participating anymore. And I see that happening now, but I think it'll happen in the future. And the question is, um, to your point, Sandy, how, how can we um, uh, encourage the media? not to confuse people. How can we encourage people to look at the media that is not out there confusing them? I'm gonna be asking you the same question, Sylvia, trust me. Uh, so what are your thoughts about that, Sandy? Well, you know, that's a really interesting question. There are some, you know, media that um, is more informational versus, um, I, I don't know what, what it is, Sylvia, you can help me. <laughs> That is entertainment. Uh, I think entertainment. parts of I think certain hours are called entertainment, and only maybe one hour a day uh, of these days of the twenty-four hour news cycle is actually called information. <laughs> yeah, so you know, this is a very salient point. <laughs> yeah, so there's informational versus entertainment, and and honestly, we we in Hawaii and I think across uh, the nation try to work with a lot of uh, younger people who are just turning eighteen and just getting the right to vote. And they are really um, engaged. They are very media savvy. They understand misinformation, disinformation. They are interested in climate change. They're interested in voting rights. They are well-read in the civil rights movement and they are worried for the future of our country. They are worried for their ability to make a living. They're interested in living wage. Like I said, um, climate change, uh, housing, um, you know, they, they are very, engaged and they are um they they want to vote they are well read on candidates they are volunteering um so um while there may be some people who are disengaged i think um there are a certain segment of the population who are ready to go um and so yeah sylvia sandy's great did you notice that i did Man. i did yeah yeah I sandy's great yeah and so, Sylvia, I'm not I wanna, just saying that because I want to sleep on her couch when I buy <laughs> and not pay for a hotel. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I want to I want to ask you about um, you know something that has surfaced in this discussion. You know, I mean, my, my notes tell me to ask you guys what can be done, and and the the low hanging fruit really is what you guys have been talking about. It's okay. There's limitations. There's suppression. There's discouragement. There's disengagement. But Common Cause and other similarly situated organizations can encourage people to get down there and vote and override, overcome the obstacles um, that the GOP has put in their way, to be determined, to wait online all day, all night, whatever it takes uh, to be absolutely willful, totally determined to vote. And I think that's gotta be part of your program. It sounds like it is part of your program, and it's a statement of commitment. It's a statement of patriotism. It's a statement of belief in the country, the democracy, and in, in the electorate. Uh, so even if not everybody who should have been able to vote can vote, even if there's going to be confusion and even litigation 
God knows what's going to happen after the election day. It's incumbent on us, and including Common Cause and everybody involved, to encourage people, uh, whoever can, should. How do you feel about that? Well, absolutely. I absolutely encourage people to vote. Um, I do want to point out, right, you know, we do everything we can to overcome barriers. There are some voters who are not going to be able to overcome those barriers. And I don't ever want anybody to say it, to think that they are unpatriotic because they were unable to do so. You know, if you, you've got to work a job to feed your family and there is no way to get out there uh, because the county has just consolidated all polling locations into one location um, in an area where there's no public transit. Uh, as is the uh, attempt happening right now in Lincoln County in Georgia, uh, you know, I want them to know that we still have their back. But besides that, besides, you know, going out and vote, voting, being active, being engaged, you know, it is the grassroots pressure. It is you speaking up for your neighbor who maybe doesn't have the time, effort, or even knowledge of what's happening to be able to speak up for themselves. So take note that even if you, have never had any problems going to vote. If you think that it's easy for you, congratulations. I'm really happy for you. Know the struggles that your neighbors have and stand up for them and speak out for them when they can't uh, speak out for themselves. What about accountability? We've seen some of that about uh, uh, Kristen Cinema uh, uh, in Arizona, where you know various elements of the Democratic Party are sanctioning her in some way. Um, but in the long term, and if you take a long term look at this, which you suggest we should do, um, what about accountability? If somebody stands in the way of voting rights in this country, they're standing in the way of a fundamental principle of the country. And over time, they should not be let off on that. There should be accountability. Is that part of the program? Should I be thinking about that? Should we be thinking about it? It's not just cinema. It's a lot of people who stand in the way of voting rights for their own agendas, their own, their own silo, self-interest, what have you. Uh, we need to identify them. We need to make sure that they don't get into office again. Um, well, you know, Common Cause doesn't support a, or oppose candidates, but we do support voters, um, you know, taking a look at the issues that matter and voting um, and, you know, voting for the candidates that um, support the things that they support, really, every election is accountability, right? That, that is the reality. You are accountable to your constituents. And if you're not doing things in their best interest, it is up to them. Um, and it is their right to vote in a way that supports their best interest. So we advocate for all voters to be aware of what's happening, to, um, to understand what their what their, um, what their representatives are voting for and against, and to choose who will really represent your best interest. Yeah, and the best interests of the country. You know, I think, I think we, we've gotten into this thing about, I'm, gonna rep I'm from uh, West Virginia, for example. I'm gonna represent the interests of West Virginia and the guys that fill my coffers, um, but I don't really care much about the country in general. Or the future of the country. That's bad thinking. In my view, every, every person in Congress has a duty to the whole country. And we seem to have forgotten that. Um, it's, it's not acceptable going forward. It's not Mr. Smith going to Washington. It isn't really. So we're out of time, uh, Sandy. I wanted you to give us the, the website that uh, you would like us to look at, maybe um, you know, to support you guys, um, and give uh, any closing remarks that you'd like to give and including including comments about Sylvia. You can talk about Sylvia now. Um, the website is um, commoncause.org. That is our national website. Um, and you can find uh, both uh, the national organization and our state chapter on that website. And Sylvia is the director of voting and elections um, for the national office and she supports the state offices. So anytime I have a question uh, about uh, any voting policy or elections policy, I contact Sylvia. She is a, a great resource of all voting and elections information. So we are so lucky to have Sylvia. And um, so that is 
Sylvia in a nutshell. <laughs> so it's wonderful to have around. <laughs> Well, we uh, we were lucky to have you both, Sandy and, and Sylvia. Sylvia, can you give us your closing comments um, to the public, for the record, what you would like to and to think and take away from all of this? Um, and let me say before you even begin that uh, I truly, in my heart, appreciate your work. Um, in in your way, you're saving the nation, and we need you. We need you so badly. We want you to continue to do what you do. You're a critical feature in the, the landscape of our democracy. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. And as Sandy said, um, so are you and other media who are really uh, bringing this to the attention of voters. And it really is paying off, right? More voters are talking about voting rights now than when I entered this field. If you'd said the words gerrymandering uh, 10 years ago, you know, the policy wonks knew what you were talking about, but the man on the street did not. And I think we're changing that. Um, as Sandy said, you know, we go to commoncause.org. I would also encourage you to go to protectthevote.net, and that is a way that you can get involved with our grassroots organizing groups. So maybe you want to send some letters or call some congresspeople or reach out to voters in other states if, if you feel like, um, you know, your representatives are already on the right side, you can get engaged. And, um, you know, I just, I, I know sometimes, and it's been a hard year for a variety of different reasons. I, I know sometimes it's, it's easy to get very disillusioned, but um, I really, really um, remind myself of how far Representative John Lewis came from sitting on a lunch counter at Woolworths to being one of the most powerful people in Congress. Um, and you couldn't have told that 20 year old boy that that's where he was going to be. So sometimes it's a long road, but uh, we keep fighting, and that's the only way we get there. Thank you, Sylvia Albert. Thank you, Sandy Ma. Thank you, Common Cause. Uh, we're counting on you. We're counting on you to help us, to save us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Aloha. Okay.